Hey guys, John Paulima here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, January 18th, 2020, and this is the weekly market update. I want to apologize. I'm a little bit under the weather. I picked up a head cold, so my voice is kind of messed up, plus I don't feel well. So this market update may not be up to my normal standards, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and go through it because there's a lot of great information this week. Especially, uh, I'm going to put some links to the most recent Howard Marks opinion or piece that he puts out. Howard Marks, very famous investor, one of my uh, guys that I follow, one of the guys that I read everything that he writes. He's written several books, and his he has a quarterly commentary that he does. It's available for free. It's kind of up there with the... Warren Buffett letters and things like that. And I think not enough people read and comprehend what a lot of these very successful men that are successful in investing and speculating, they don't do enough reading and comprehending how these people are successful. And that's kind of what I've been doing over the last several years so is to say, if I'm not successful in this particular endeavor, why am I not successful? And what are the successful people doing that I'm not doing? So I just want to summarize a little bit of Howard Marks's letter this that was put out last week. It was titled You Bet. It was really a good read. It's entertaining. He talks about games. He talks about uh, playing poker in college and gin rummy and different things and backgammon and he starts to relate these things these the games and how it goes into gambling specifically talking about poker playing and other games of chance and how that relates to investing and how uh luck and skill are intertwined so it's i'm not going to go over the whole thing it's a pretty decent read you should probably read it a couple times obviously there'll be a link to it in the show notes but one of the two of the things i wanted to pull out of this letter is something that Howard Marks has said before and other famous investors that are successful have said and it's something that I've adopted and let me go over these two things quotes and then I will get back to the commentary it says success in investing doesn't come from buying good things but from buying things well and it's essential to know the difference it's not a matter of what you buy but what you pay for it and that's exactly right you know we've talked about the fact that on a historical basis, the general stock market, if you will, is very expensive. And John Hussman, uh, Robert Schiller, whoever you want to look at as far as valuations of the market and anticipated returns in the future, they're not good because we know from the historical data that we have, the historical narrative, that if you buy the general stock market at these levels, your anticipated returns over the next 10 years are going to be in the low single digits. As a matter of fact, according to Hussman, if you want to listen to what he says, your anticipated average annual return over the next 10 years, if you buy the general stock market at this level, is less than 1% per year. And you're going to be looking at a very large drawdown somewhere in there. What do I mean by drawdown? You're going to be looking at about a drop in the stock market somewhere in that 10-year period that's pretty substantial. And for you novice investors or guys starting out, will psychologically damage you such that you will probably will abandon the stock market or investing for the rest of your life, or at least for a good period of time. That's what's happened after every one of these bubbles that's been blown over the last 20 years. People get so burned, they abandon and throw up their arms and say, I can't do anything here. So that's why I go and see what these successful people have done and try to emulate it. So buying good, buying things cheaply, buying things that are undervalued. I'm trying to make these cliches. They sound like cliches, but simple. Buying a dollar for 50 cents buying things that are out of favor and that are abandoned by everyone else but yet have a catalyst to go higher I'm, you know there were several great interviews this week guys harris kupperman was interviewed by dan ferris on the stansbury investor hour i'm going to put a link to that you should really listen to that harris is a good guy 
He's very successful, and he really gets into his methodology about how he selects stocks and where he has an advantage and where he doesn't have an advantage. I've tried to explain this before, but if you listen to that podcast, that interview, he really, really explains it very well. And uh, so what I'm trying to get at, the same thing, there's a Rick Rule was interviewed by Meb Faber this week. I'll, I'll put that on there too. Rick, Rick Rule being a billionaire resource stock investor, financier, if you will, big shot over at Sprott Asset Management. And there's a common theme if you listen to these successful people about how they have an edge or an advantage. You have no, you and I have no edge in Apple stock or Netflix or Tesla. There's too many analysts. All the information is known. It's just, it's not, you're not going to beat these computers and these analysts at these big comp uh, big investment firms and, and, and the other thing is especially in short-term trading you have zero advantage the computers are going to kill you your only advantage is to be out in front of them to be able to anticipate an event to a catalyst an inflection point in an industry or stock because the computer is not programmed to do that a perfect example was Last week in shipping stocks, I mean, shipping stocks sold off quite a bit. Why? Well, a lot of rates came down. Uh, seasonal rates were high, and they were exacerbated by IMO, IMO 2020 and the other things, but they came off. So the pr program in the computers is when shipping rates go high because of the bear market that's existed in shipping stocks for 10 years, the computers sell. I mean, they can't forecast or analyze or understand what's happening with IMO 2020 or IMO 2030 or uh, the differences in price between high and low sulfur fuel oils and what sh what companies have scrubbers. No, they just look backdated and say, well, every time shipping rates have went up, spiked up in the last 10 years, our, the backwards looking data says sell them short and you make money. So that's what I'm talking about an advantage or a way to look at things that the computers or the brainiacs that are short term trading can't do. Remember, our advantage over a lot of these hedge fund managers and private, private equity people and all these big shot investors, they have quarterly to quarterly targets they are get judged on. And if we can stretch our thinking out to three to five years, they can't survive that long. They can't take a position in uranium and have it sit there and do nothing for two or three quarters. They'd be fired. So at the end of the Howard Marks article this month, when he talks about gambling and forecasting and odds and all these things and, and, and how, how it relates to the stock market and investing he says and this is really this is why i like reading these guys they really come up with some really great ideas investing is a game of skill meaning inferior players can't expect to be above average winners in the long run but it also includes elements of chance meaning skill won't win out every time in the long run superior skill will overcome the impact of bad luck but in the short run luck can overwhelm skill and the two can be indistinguishable so I, that's why I like keeping going back to poker. You know, he talks about when online poker first started and every Tom, Dick, and Harry was on there, not playing correctly, not understanding how to calculate pot odds and, and things like that. And sure, some of these guys made money, but what happened is a lot of professional people or even people like myself, I mean, I read all the books, I practiced, and I got on there. And I was cleaning up on a lot of these uh, schlubs because... They had no clue what they were doing. They were playing every hand. They play out of position. They didn't know how to calculate odds. It was crazy. But then what happened over time is the skilled players came on there. They just took all the amateurs and schlubs money away and they went away. It became more and more difficult to make money because the schlubs were wiped out and pushed out of the market or pushed off out of the games. So he talks about that. So I wanted to bring this up because you know, you really have to put some work and study into this. There's a lot of psychology involved. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of game theory when I'm talking about investing and speculating. And I think, you know, studying 
people that are successful and listening to what they say and trying to incorporate that into your style, your individual style, because everybody has their own investing and speculating styles, not the same. You know, risk tolerances are different, goals are different, amount of capital is different, all these things come into play. So this is why I'm adamant about, you know, really looking at this stuff. And this guy has like years of letters there. I mean, you could just sit there and read this stuff. Uh, and maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll go back and pick some of the good ones or pick some chapters out of some of his books and try to uh, expand upon this because it's an ongoing education, guys. It's not just listening to a couple podcasts. You really have to read. You have to think. You have to ponder these things, okay? You know, a lot of these videos and watching videos and stuff is entertainment. You don't, you don't uh, hold the information, if you will. So I encourage you guys to uh, do what I do, which is spend a lot of time reading and analyzing. I take walks and I and I ponder these things. I think about them. You know, the previous stupid ways I would do things or why I would select a company. You know, we've talked about this before. Write it down. Why did I make this investment? Why did I put money into this speculation? Was it just on a whim, a tip, whatever, instead of analyzing it and coming up with a logical reason that I understood an inflection point, a catalyst, something that was going to change the market's perception of this particular security and revalue it higher. Okay, enough on that. So, you know, a big oil bull, there's a reason why. Um, I think that the lack of investment that's been in oil outside of the shale space is going to come back to haunt us. It's starting to already, I think. And I like, again, listening to the 800-pound gorillas in particular industries to see what they're seeing. And here we have Schlumberger. If you're not familiar with, with who Schlumberger is, they're one of the largest oil field service providers in the world. I think they're the largest. So they do everything in an oil field, okay, to help EMP companies find, drill, and produce oil and gas. And a couple of things that they have said in their recent quarterly report or what their CEO said, and you can, I'll put a link to the transcript. It's on Seeking Alpha. You can go back and read it. But I thought two things, two quotes were pretty good. First of all, I'll jump to the second one first because he said it earlier. He said, we expect the second year of market contraction in the North American lands with a decline in the high single digits to double digit range. So the oil field service 800 pound gorilla is expecting North American onshore business to decline by the high single digits to double digit range. Well, why is that? When we're talking about North American lands, I mean, this guy's kind of a French guy, so I think his grammar he, he doesn't, sometimes it's hard to maybe understand, but what's basically being said here is that shale's in decline for the second year. Their business is going down. As a matter of fact, they talk about how they're going to rationalize their business. And we've talked about that and why that is, and that's continuing. You know, this idea that we're going to go to 25 million barrels a day and we're just going to keep growing. You know, shale growth is growing, as I've said before, but it's the, the rate is decreasing. It's going down. Why? It doesn't make money. It's not cash flow positive. And all the people that were financing it via high yield junk bonds and equity issuances, that's all gone. So if you have to live inside your cash flow and they've had a hard time cash flowing positively, then obviously this business is going to go into decline. Notwithstanding the fact that several analysts think that they're at their peaks anyways of production. We, we certainly think that's the case in the Bakken and the Eagleford, and now we're into the Permian. And if that rolls over, then the United States, as the largest oil producer, will then have to be reevaluated. The positive thing for us as speculators and what we were, what I've been thinking over the last couple of years is now coming to fruition. You know, Schlumberger doesn't just operate on land. They, they operate offshore. They have uh, Cameron's, one of their businesses. They do a lot of the blowout preventers that are put on the seafloor of these wells. And what they're saying is offshore activity will increasingly grow towards deep water basins in the latter part of 2020 reflecting the investment by IOCs, which are international oil companies and large independents. So this is exactly what we were anticipating. Now I didn't, I forgot to put in the Basso Analytics ultra deep water uh, analysis for this month, but 
you can go to their website. I'll put a link. And the floater part of the business is now in acknowledged recovery. We're seeing more trending higher. It's not a full-fledged boom. We're not into that, though. But the, the green shoots are there. Activities increasing. Day rates are increasing. We're starting to see this inflection. And I will show you later on in other charts where that's being reflected. You know, I, th I thought this was good. This U.S. shale, we've had a lot of discussion about inventories, how many wells can be drilled, this big bank of drilled but uncompleted wells, and this is what's happening. I mean, U.S. shale is chewing into the inventory of drilled but unfracked wells. Um, it's obviously the amount of wells that have been drilled but not fracked and produced is in decline. So more and more information keeps coming in that seems to be indicating that shale is not going to be the multi-decade. This is not, we're not the new Saudi Arabia, it appears. It appears that we are in fact peaking. And what's unfortunate is, is that because of U.S. shale and the explosive growth and the boom that was allowed or enabled by cheap money, we didn't invest anywhere else in the world or we didn't we didn't you know hundreds of billions of dollars have to be invested each year just to stay in place you know we're, we're using 36 billion barrels of oil a year and last year was i think the lowest amount of found oil in the last 70 years so you can't produce 36 billion barrels a year and then only find four or five or ten billion barrels a year at some point those lines cross and you have a price uh, explosion to the upside. And I think that's what's going to happen. We are going to have a energy crisis. We are going to run into a situation, I think, over the next year or so, a couple years, I don't know exactly. We are going to have very substantially higher oil prices simply because we haven't made sufficient investment because of the mirage of supply that shale uh, mesmerized everyone. So, uh, and I think, you know, we are starting to see a change in behavior. Here's a chart. Uh, it's an offshore oil and gas. Uh, what it's showing here is you is the billions of barrels of uh, oil equivalent. So the green is your anticipated amount of, of new oil that's going to be found this year, oil and liquids. And this is red, your gas, natural gas equivalent. You can see because of the low investment, we weren't really finding a lot of new barrels. This is a huge gap that's going to come back and bite us in the backside. The lack of investment, and I'll show you another chart, it pretty much lines up the low amount of investment that was done resulted in lack of new productive capacity. And if you're using 36 billion barrels a year, you're living off investments in found fields from decades ago. And sufficient investment has not been made to supply the world. Now, I've said this before, you know, regardless of EVs and all these other things, uh, we don't really know if they're, how they're gonna take off or if they're gonna be sufficient, but we do know that oil demand's growing. You know, one thing that the environmental people need to understand, or even the general investing public that doesn't seem to understand, 100% of a barrel of oil is not necessarily just used for transportation fuels. Half approximately half of a barrel of oil is used for all types of other products. And we've talked about this before. So oil is not going away. And as the population adds 80 million people to the earth every year, you, you know, you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. And at some point, uh, you know, if you didn't make sufficient investments in some of these commodities, you're going to have a period of higher prices as the price mechanism rations the available supply and sends price signals to developers, producers to increase their production. But these things take time. It doesn't just happen in a week or two. Here's another chart. Uh, this is from a Rystad uh, engineering folks that do a lot of oil field analysis. I'll put a link to this particular article. But here's the approved offshore greenfield investments by year of sanctioning in billions of dollars. So you can see the big, you know, the big fall off in investment because cash flows were constricted. It pretty much matches with the lower amounts of found oil and gas. 
I mean, they go hand in hand. If you invest less money, you get less found reserves and less production. But as we can see, over the last, uh, you know, in 2017, 2018, we kind of bottomed and leveled out. Last year, spending was up, you know, 50% offshore. This is just offshore now. And we can anticipate that this is going to continue to climb over the next several years. That's my anticipation. And we should see rationalization and increases in the offshore industry that will follow. You got to remember, a lot of the companies that existed back here don't, don't exist anymore or have been rationalized. I'm not saying they've been rationalized enough. I'm not saying that more rigs don't need to go to scrap. Well, what I'm telling you is, is the industry that existed here is not the same one that existed here. It's quite a bit smaller. But if we see these increased cash flows continue from the oil companies, we will see increased spending. You know, we've talked about this before too, that your international oil companies like Exxon, Total, uh, British Petroleum, Chevron, their reserve life indexes have been going down over time they need to invest so they will be looking i mean you see major fines offshore guiana and places like that uh what's going on offshore israel and egypt and cyprus big huge gas fines i even like the terms they use i mean one of the largest gas fines in recent years offshore israel they called it leviathan so i think that uh we're going the recovery is happening the green shoots are there it's time to take positions I think that we're going in the right direction. Now, if you believe we're going to have a worldwide economic collapse and oil demand is going to fall off or that EVs are going to supplement sufficient oil demand and you think the end of oil is in sight, then you certainly shouldn't have this view. That's not my view. I've said that before. I want to talk about gold a little bit here. If I can get it to come up. Uh. Let's see. Oh, here we go. So I found this chart uh, during my readings. Seems to be from Katusa Research. Somebody put it on Twitter, but I thought it was good. You know, I believe that we're in a new gold bull market. I've stated that before for several reasons. The amount of negative yielding debt around the world, the increasing amount of debt, the propensity of the Western nations to make promises they can't keep that will necessitate keeping interest rates very low and in the negative real rate range as they print money to pay for all of these old people and all the promises they made to them. So this just shows you various gold bull markets of various years and you can see that this is the bull length in months, and you can see that we're, we're right here. So we have on any metric or any comparison to previous gold bull markets, if in fact you believe we're in a gold bull market, many of you may disagree, I don't know, I believe we are, you see that uh, if we have a long drawn out one like we had from 2000 to 2012, we've got quite a bit of a run left. If it's gonna be a blow off like a lot of them were, like in the 70, 74, in 76 to 80 then we should be anticipating but it looks like i think what's going to happen is a slow death by inflation over time by these central banks and i think that we could see a you know this longer term last for longer bull market you know everything that's happening in the gold bull in the gold industry your ability to find new gold mines has gone down central bank buying is up I'm going to show you a chart later on that, uh, you know, gold ETFs, there's a lot of interest, even though I saw that the uh, U.S. Mint had the not a lot of interesting gold bullion purchases. It's at one of the lowest levels uh, in a long time, but we're seeing gold ETF. We're seeing institutional money start to come back into gold. We're starting to see Western investors come back into gold. Previous gold runs or price increases have been mainly attributable to Chinese, Indian, Russian buying. The Russian Central Bank just continues to stack gold. Chinese continue to stack gold. I don't, they have many, they, they absorb all of their internal gold productions, not exported. So I think, you know, gold is supposedly supposed to be this barbarous relic, no one likes it, but yet the central banks keep accumulating it. Good article by uh, 
Goring and Rosenzweig. I will put a link to a blog post they did this week, Return of the Western Investor, when they're talking about gold. A couple quotes. Are we beginning to see the return of the West of Western interest in the gold markets? We believe we are. For all of 2019, physical gold ETFs have accumulated 350 tons of metal, and total holdings now stands at 25. 2,560 tons, almost equal to their peak in 2012. That was when the gold price peaked out before. So they also have a chart here. They talk about total known ETF holdings of silver. You can see that uh, kind of was in a range for a while and it's recently just kind of broken out of that range. There's a lot more interest in precious metals. I also know that platinum recently crested, I think, the $1,000 level. So we are starting to see more and more interest we are starting to see uh i think a, a, a what we're what we are anticipating i mean goring and rosenzweig have been out there saying that they have a price target on gold of twelve thousand dollars an ounce i, I mean I, you've seen you know jim rickards ten thousand dollars an ounce people think this is wacky it doesn't necessarily mean the gold price is making you more wealthy it means that the depreciation of the currencies that they are denominated in but if you think gold is going to be in a bull market, how you, as a speculator, take advantage of that is that you buy gold mining equities. And you know what I've said this before, I mean, they just have such leverage. That's where you make your capital appreciation. That's where you make your your possibility of life-changing wealth is, is buying select mining stocks at the right time. Now, obviously, uh, gold and silver mining, just like any other mining, is a terrible business, except for the times when it is in a uh, upswing. And that's what we've talked about before, understanding the cyclicality, understanding the volatility, and making them your friends. That's the whole basis of how Rick Rule became a billionaire. So you have to understand these things. You have to put them into practice. You know, these are not buy and hold investments, these mining stocks. So I think that uh, we are gonna see a huge, we've already seen, we've got a, small royalty company in the portfolio, actionable intelligence portfolio, that's up almost 200% since we started the newsletter a couple years ago. So, and gold really hasn't moved that super high yet. So, I think we're in a gold bull market. I think we're moving into a commodity mark bull market. I think that there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunities. I think things are turning our way. If you are interested in understanding how we find vehicles to take advantage of the things that we talk about in these videos, in the various articles I put out, in the blog posts I put out, what I talk about on Twitter. If you are in agreement that we are indeed entering a new commodity upcycle, then it may be of interest to you to subscribe to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. That's our product, $79 a year. A link in the show notes. You may want to take a subscription because we are now seeing the money, the liquidity begin to flow into our side of the boat. It's under invested in. It's been in a 10 year bear market. And I think we may be leaving that now. So that's it for this week, guys. I appreciate the support. I appreciate the comments. Please, if you choose not to subscribe and support us that way, we do have a Patreon where you can, you can contribute $5 a month minimum, and I will give you the current month's stock pick from our newsletter. That's not a subscription. That's just the current month's stock pick, so you can get a flavor of what our writing's about, what our picks are about. The other way you can support us is just support this channel. The more people that subscribe or comment or interact with us, helps us in the YouTube analytics and the rankings and more people will be, uh, well, can be turned on to what we're talking about here or in some cases subjected to what we're talking about here. So excuse the cold for this week, guys. I apologize, but uh, that's it for this week and have a good week and we'll talk to you, talk to you soon. Thank you.